Hello and welcome back to the ninth episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And these were Lorentz transformations derived in previous episodes for both subluminal and superluminal frames of reference. And as promised, we will show today that taking into account both of these families of solutions leads to disturbance of causality, but precisely in a way that we already know from quantum theory. So despite the claims by Richard Feynman, who said that we have no idea about any more basic mechanism from which quantum theory can be deduced, we will show that there exists a more fundamental theory secretly underlining all of the quantum weirdness. And that theory is special relativity. So here we are with two branches of possible solutions. The first one, the orthodox one, corresponds to observers that move with velocities smaller than c, and they are characterized by the usual Lorentz transformation formulas. The second family of solutions corresponds to observers moving with superluminal speeds larger than c. And mathematically speaking, both of these families of solutions satisfy all the necessary requirements. In particular, they both preserve the constancy of the speed of light. So in principle, there is no mathematical reason for us to rule out any of them. The subluminal family of solutions corresponds to a usual hyperbolic rotation of space-time, and the angle of that rotation has to be smaller than 45 degrees. On the other hand, the superluminal branch of solutions is also a hyperbolic rotation of space-time, but this time, the angle of that rotation has to be larger than 45 degrees. And in the extreme case, when the observer is moving infinitely fast, the corresponding transformation describes the exchange between time and space. So let's check out what happens when we allow superluminal particles to exist within the realm of special relativity. So imagine that there is a guy who can emit superluminal particles. For example, he could have a gun and pull the trigger so that a superluminal bullet pops out. So let us denote that event with an A, and suppose that our bullet hits somebody else at a distant event B. Since the space-time interval between A and B is space-like, there always exists another inertial subluminal frame of reference for which the order of the events A and B is reversed. So in that other frame of reference, we first have the event B and then the event A. So we already stumble upon the first crazy consequence. The event B in the first frame of reference was an absorption of the bullet, but in the moving frame of reference, it becomes an emission. And similarly for the event A, which in the first frame of reference was an emission of the bullet, but in the second primed frame of reference, it becomes an absorption. So these crazy consequences are completely inevitable if we allow a superlinal object into special relativity. And this is enough for many people to just discard this eventuality, because in particular, if the bullet was to carry some information, then if the information was sent from A to B in the first frame of reference, then in the second frame of reference, it would have to be sent from B to A, from the receiver to the sender. But it turns out that we have overlooked something very important. In order to send any information, we have to have a carrier of that information, for example, a bullet. But also, we need to control that bullet. We need to be able to pull the trigger or not pull the trigger on demand. And that's how we send information, by sending logical zeros or ones. So let us assume that there exists some physical mechanism in the past of the event A that we can control and decide whether we want to shoot the bullet or not. And that mechanism determines the exact moment at which the gun is shot. On the other hand, the distant observer B, who is shot by the bullet, cannot predict that. There is nothing in his past 
that would determine the exact moment at which the event B occurs. And so far this is all pretty obvious, but things become interesting when we try to analyze the same situation in the moving prime frame of reference. Because in this frame of reference, it appears that the bullet has been shot at B and reached the gun at A sometime later. And let us ask a difficult question. What caused the emission of the bullet at B in the moving frame of reference? What determines that event? So you may say that the reason for the emission at B is located far away at A and possibly in the future of B. But such an explanation is non-local. And if you want to find a local description of the event B, the local reason why the emission at B happens, you simply cannot do it. There is absolutely nothing at the past word line of B that carries any information about that event. So to a local observer who's just sitting next to B, the emission of the bullet has to look completely spontaneous and unpredictable, or as we usually say in quantum theory, undeterministic. So it's really cool that, contrary to the claim by Feynman, we were able to discover the element of true indeterminism only based on elementary special relativity. But what is not cool is that there exists a fully deterministic and local description of our setup in the first frame of reference, but it does not exist in the second one. And that clearly contradicts the principle of relativity, mm -hmm. which becomes especially clear when we consider those two observers, A and B, to be just identical elementary particles. And to resolve this conflict with Galilean principle of relativity, we need to conclude that the undeterministic behavior of emitted superluminal objects must take place in all frames of reference. They would need to be emitted only in a completely spontaneous and undeterministic fashion. And notice that even if you had a source of supernatural particles at our disposal, paradoxically, we would not be able to use that source to send supernatural information, simply because we would not be able to control that information. So, is there any problem with those particles, really? Albert Einstein honestly disliked quantum theory for its indeterminism, hence his famous expression that God does not play dice. So it's quite an irony that a true indeterminism of hypothetical supernatural particles is just a straightforward consequence of his own theory. But what about a more orthodox case of subluminal particles? Do they also have to exhibit indeterministic behavior? So, according to special relativity involving superluminal observers, yes, they do. Let us consider a normal, old-fashioned scenario in which we have a subluminal particle that decays into a pair of other subluminal particles. And in order to find out whether such process can be fully deterministic, let us consider that process from the perspective of an observer that moves infinitely fast. So if you go back to the previous formulas and consider the case of V going to infinity, that corresponds to a transformation that interchanges time and space. Which means that our process viewed from the superluminal frame of reference corresponds to a diagram that has interchanged axes t and x. And in that frame, all of our decaying particles seem to be moving superluminally, which shows that being superluminal is relative. But since we have already shown that any decay with participation of a superluminal particle cannot be described in any local and deterministic fashion, the same has to apply to a decay involving subluminal particles, simply because those particles are also superluminal for some inertial observers. And the presence or absence of a local and deterministic mode of description cannot depend on the choice of the observer. So it seems that special relativity extended to superluminal observers does not lead to any obvious causal paradoxes but instead allows us to understand the origin of one of the most fundamental mysteries of quantum theory, indeterminism. 
And from this perspective, it's inevitable that interactions or decays of all types of particles, whether subluminal or superluminal, has to be fundamentally indeterministic. But what about another fundamental mystery of quantum theory listed by Feynman? Quantum superposition. Does it also follow from special relativity? Let us consider a simple photo experiment in which a single photon is emitted at A and moves towards a mirror at M, at which it's reflected back and moves towards B. And now I'm going to say something obvious. Suppose that we place a detector between A and M that absorbs a photon and detects it. And if you do that, then a second detector placed between M and B will not detect the photon, simply because it has already been absorbed earlier. And similarly, if the second detector clicks absorbing and detecting the photon, then the first detector could not have clicked earlier, simply because the photon would not reach the second detector. But now, let us consider the exact same scenario, but from the point of view of the infinitely fast moving observer. In this case, we need to interchange time and space. And in this frame of reference, the whole process looks completely different. It appears as if the pair of photons was emitted at the mirror, one going towards A and the other going towards B. But it is not really a pair. Because if you try to measure them with two detectors, then only one of these detectors can click. And never two of them. So in this scenario, if we do not make a measurement, the motion of the photon is characterized by two paths at the same time. But if you measure the photon, it can only be caught at a single place, and never two of them. Which is the exact same behavior that we described in previous episode when we characterized the motion of a single photon in a state of quantum superposition. And it seems that this mysterious behavior is just a straightforward consequence of maintaining in special relativity two families of observers, both subluminal and superluminal. It turns out that also other fundamental properties of quantum theory follow from this approach. For example, the so-called complex probability amplitudes. And you can read about it in our paper that is linked below. Or you can get a copy of my textbook on relativity, that is called Unusually Special Relativity, where I discuss all these problems in much greater detail. The link is also in the description. And in the next episode, we will go back to the orthodox special relativity, with even more surprises to come. Cheers. Mm -hmm.